are going to welcome to the stage um, Anna Yang, who will be looking at uh, redesigning collaboration for sustainability. Um, she will be our chair. She is executive director of the Sustainability Accelerator at Chatham House and will be exploring how we can redesign collaboration to deliver a positive future for our planet. Thank you, Anna. So um, I think the best is probably if I take my seat here and invite my fellow speakers to join. So I have Indy, Judy, and Dan. So thank you. Um, so my name is Anna Yang. I'm the executive. Executive Director of Sustainability Accelerator here at Chatham House. And so before I hand over to our amazing panelists, um, I'll just tell you a very short story about the accelerator. But since Eric started uh, about the personal story, so I am a Brazilian Taiwanese, uh, so born and raised in Brazil, grew up in Latin America, um, and now I work in Europe. So there is, I am a product of the globalization as well. Um, so the, and then Vicky was talking about the age of the London Design Biennale. We're just one year old. Uh, so the accelerator was launched uh, in May 27 last year. And it was while Chatham House was celebrating its centenary during COVID, during lockdown. And we were launched as part of our second century objective to accelerate one of the pillars of our work, which is sustainable and equitable future. From our base at Chatham House, we research, we assemble, we incubate ideas, we bring together people who can help the world accelerate uh, to a sustainable future. Broadly, we have three objectives. So we work on mainstreaming and accelerating uh, sustainable and radical ideas. We future gaze and we focus on the intersection of finance, innovation and sustainability. And then the third one, which is actually the closest to my heart, is enlarge the space for stakeholders to interact and to co-create. And so working here is a constant reminder of the crisis that we're all living in. I mean, yesterday I was in a Ukraine a war discussion and then sort of the unfolding of the geopolitical implications while we have an environmental crisis going on with some very, very deep social injustice. And so in a way, we're always trying to sense make at all of these things coming at us. And one of the potential possible outcomes for you know, this war is that the world may be multipolar or at least will be bipolar, or it's coming, going towards that. But it is also my deep belief that, you know, as Eric was showing those walls being put around us, is ideas and imaginations have no boundaries. And that's why I really believe, you know, why we need to foster these. And so at the heart of the accelerator is that collaboration is everything. And so that for us to address all of these crises, this is the only way that we can move forward. And Renata's point about why, who, and how, that's what we work towards, right? It's like, why is because we care about a better future. Who is how do we enlarge and bring more and more people and hold the space for these peoples to interact among themselves, but also with us, and also be, you know, power sharing. I'm all about power sharing. My team knows that. And so it's all about being at the service uh, for change agents, for innovators and creators to come together. And we'd like to think of ourselves as sort of a fire pit. So we draw energy, we provide a focal point, but also we give out warmth. So that this is a place that should be able to enable people to come up as a whole so we can connect our analytical mind, because a lot of what Chatham House does is analysis. But we also know that we're not going to change the world without people bringing their heart into this. And so we hope that our work here at Chatham House and also with all the partnership that we have with the LDB team and other future partnerships that we may have can continue to build on this idea that came out from a conversation that we had uh, with a consulting team uh, on the storytelling is 
fellowship of change, right? I'm a superhero geek, so like this kind of like superhero assemble. I love that idea of like all of us coming together and then we can all unleash our power of imagination and action. And it is really about connecting the commitment with the passion and then for the deeper transformation that we would not be able to do individually. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to our amazing speakers. I'm gonna start, oh, it's in order now. So I have Judy, Dan, and Indy. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to speak to you all today. When we think locally and globally, especially in terms of diversity, equality, and inclusion, there are two significant opportunities that can be contributing to building increased collaboration towards innovative and appropriately sustainable solutions. Almost everyone have heard of the saying, everyone is an artist, in which Joseph Boyce proposed that creativity within ordinary people is in continuity with the creativity of professionals. The first opportunity we have is to invest in the building of that working relationship between ordinary people and professionals, drawing on the power that is released when we include people and enable them to come forward with their lived experience. The principle is that we should allow the people who are most affected to lead on the agenda and therefore get them to be intrinsic to the solutions. The second opportunity lies within the fact that there is a world of diversity within every country. Ethnic minorities are particularly present in our cities and in London, for example, it is 41%. You can hardly, as a block, call us minorities. We are part of the mainstream. But these people that we call ethnic minorities in the UK are in fact in continuity with the ethnic majorities of the world. The white population across the world makes up only 11%. By giving a focus to building working collaborations with ethnic communities, any dominant population can acquire a sense of an ease with working with different cultures. And perhaps intercultural skills that can help them to make effective collaborations internationally that we wish to see so very much on the world stage. Our ethnic minorities are like the living world news. They are in day-to-day -day contact with family, with colleagues across the world. And they can inspire us with stories of drastic issues. They allow us to work from a place of identification with people that might be so very remote. They can bring us so much closure to what we work with in terms of realities. But besides bringing us closer to these realities, there's also the inspiration of the unique cultural visions of each culture that can give us a much deeper passion towards working for nature and for people. Some time ago when I was in Mexico, I was speaking to people with the, the members of the Weisho tribe, and one of them said to me, you know, in the West, they use the term Mother Earth. They think, oh, just because the Earth provides resources and food, it must be our mother. But for us, beyond Mother Earth, there's Grandmother Moon, there's Father Sun, there's Brother Deer. When we take care of the environment, we're only taking care of our family. So many culture-based visions of nature reconnect us deeply, not delivering something new, but reawakening something that we always used to have. But for us, many of us have to recapture because we've moved societally towards a much more mechanistic and science-based world. 
I love science and the vital contribution it makes. However, as important as science is, we can use the counterbalance of the arts, of creativity and vision in order to bring us into a new kind of collaboration that is richly human. Sometimes when people start talking about trees as if they're only machines for locking carbon, when they're so beautiful, when they resonate with symbology as the trees of life, for example, I begin to think that the messages are missing that enable us to connect with collaborations creatively with all the dimensions of our humanity. So today, I look to creative professionals to stimulate the engagement of people, shape the processes, the messages, and the solutions to bring a quality of energy that moves us in a different way, especially towards new culturally informed transformative solutions that enable us to be passionate and engaged and make us work ever more harder together towards the possibility of a sustainable green future for all of us. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Judy. Dan? Okay, I'm going to stand up if that's yeah. okay. Sorry. This is the uh, design, the design uh, environment. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether I can follow um, Judy's talk in such um, kind of eloquence around, um, or such kind of poetic nature of, of it. Um, perhaps mine's a bit more, um, a bit less, um, a bit less deep, maybe, but maybe deep in other ways. So I think one of the one of the things when we talk about things like sustainability is in the topic of, of of this. One of the questions that we often come to is this idea that sort of um, you know we don't necessarily have good models of what to do in the future, right? So if we're thinking about actual in the face of the climate crisis and 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 you know kind of climate futures, do we actually have the imagination potentially that we need in order to to deal with it, whatever deal with it means? And so you see often these kind of points of view, this sort of almost a, a pessimism, perhaps, that we talk about we're in a crisis of imagination. And maybe we are, but juxtaposed perhaps with this idea that maybe there are other, there are other possibilities present. There are voices that maybe are just not heard yet that can be enabled or that can be perhaps inspired to bring these ideas to life. And so I sort of think these, these two quotes go together in some way in that, that perhaps the imagination that we need is present or it's possible to, to bring it to life. And I think design is something that actually enables that or can enable that in many ways. But maybe following a bit of some of the sort of, I guess, the kind of, uh, kind of aspects of the kind of ongoing crisis, if you like, that, that we're in, that maybe that Eric touched on a bit, is this idea that perhaps the reality we experience is essentially a, a mass of competing fictions, as J.G. Ballard said quite, quite a while ago, in fact. And maybe this is even more true now in the way we think about the sort of beliefs about what the future will be like or what is in store for us or how the world is going or do you believe in, in, in climate change? Do you believe in, in pandemics and so on? Is it possible to have these multiple truths at the same time? And I think one of the things that designers can do is can facilitate some of these um, some of these kind of fictions, if you like, to become more uh, to materialise them in ways that people can engage with, can understand, can react to them, can 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 be provoked. And so, I, my question really is is sort of how can design help people collaborate and and imagine and um, and kind of explore and experience different futures together in an age of crises. Um, and part of that is about the way that design can essentially enable us to, to kind of like rehearse different futures. You know, designers are extremely good at taking ideas about how the world could be or perhaps how the world might be and putting it into a form that people can engage with. They can live with it, they can experience it, they can, they can react to it, certainly, but you can also critique it. You can effectively rehearse those different futures. And, you know, and in some ways, that I think is something that the Biennale can, by you know, even the kind of breadth of the different pavilions, the different exhibits, the different um, collaborations between different countries, they're almost offering different views of what the world is like or what the world could be like. And you know, designers are good at this. 
And you could look at it in the sense all of perhaps all of policy making is also this, but in a very different way. And I, but I think it's underexplored that the the potential contribution that design can make in this in the, in this field. And of course, part of this is learning from people who are already experiencing what we might think of here as kind of our futures. There were already people living with climate change. There were already people whose lives have been disrupted by, by, by these aspects. And so, you know, the lived experience of, of that is something that I think should be, should be part of it. And in some ways, it can form these collaborations. It can, it can help inform them. Um, so just a few, just quickly, a few projects that I've been involved with in different ways that I think maybe or, or, or associated with that, that I think offer something in this area. So these are things both um, from my work at uh, TU Eindhoven in the Netherlands um, and before that Carnegie Mellon and, and the RCA. Um, and, and also with the Imaginaries Lab, which is a kind of consultancy. Um, we've done quite a lot of work on methods for collaborative imagination. So how do people together generate ideas? How do we help people think of things that possibly they've never thought of before? That kind of the idea that everyone is creative in the way that the, the way that, that Judy mentioned, perhaps the, the Joseph Boyce idea. Um, but are there ways that designers can bring that out in people and enable people to kind of construct visions for how they think things could be different? And some of the projects here, for example, the the, there's a, a project we have around new metaphors, so gener generating different metaphors for rethinking about things, about the future, about big topics. But also the, the one on the lower left there um, around um, constructing landscapes together, which I think touches a bit on some of the different kinds of maps that, that Eric showed, where people construct landscapes of how they imagine their own lives in the future. You know, what are the hills you're going to have to climb? Or as a group, what are the rivers we're going to have to bridge? And, and what do they look like? So, you know, it's not, it doesn't solve anything, but it enables people to externalize and materialize things that possibly otherwise you just wouldn't talk about or are difficult to put into words. Um, I won't talk about all the projects here, but there's a, there's a couple. The, the collaborative futuring ones in the, in the middle, I think, are quite interesting, where, for example, the project at the top that Yuli Sikorska um, has done, been doing in Berlin around speculating around um, a European cities experiencing a wave of heat waves or a series of major heat waves over the next 30, 40 years. How do they deal with them? What is everyday life like? Do some cities respond well and others badly? Do, how, what level is it, does it work at? Does it work at a neighborhood level where perhaps people re-green particular areas or set up cooling centers? And so she's done this work with speculating with members of the public in a particular neighborhood in Berlin about how they would live in that world. What, what, would, they, what would they want to do? What would they want to see? What would they, how do they see their lives in that, in that world? Rosemarine over, um, Rosemarine over there at, at TU Eindhoven um, has been working on the idea of a kind of city room, if you like, which some of you, I'm sure, know the concept in, in, in kind of planning, but around the near future. So for Eindhoven, for the city, what would the near future of it be like if certain commitments were actually made to, to deal with, with climate crisis? How would everyday life change? And it's a sort of, so it's this kind of participatory engagement in that way. Um, and finally, a couple of kind of more academic projects, if you like, where we're looking at a research level. The, the top right one, the Imagine Project, which is a collaboration between Norway and, and the Netherlands and the UK, looking at how sort of public visions of how they think, how the public sees the future, particularly in relation to sustainability, um, sort of butt up against expert visions. And can we use design fiction and speculative design in a sort of public engagement sense to, to enable those kind of visions to, you know, the frictions between them to be explored? And also the um, Centre for Unusual Collaborations down the bottom right, which is a, a, a Dutch um, organisation that, that's doing some really interesting work. This particular project playing with the trouble that I'm part of around using methods from play and games to help people from different disciplinary backgrounds kind of align worldviews or at least understand each other's worldviews through play. So, yeah, I will just, to finish then, I think we, you know, we need imagination, but we also need kind of collaborative imagination. We need people to collaborate in order to think together, to imagine together. And design is good at doing that, basically. I think design is a way into doing that that, that can complement policy, but it can also perhaps offer a different perspective on it. So I think in climate futures and sustainability in general, collaboration needs imagination. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And Indy, um, I just want to say, I'm going to fangirl you a little bit. Um, we are a huge fan of Dark Lab Matter Lab. <laughs> A lot of what we do. I said my team was like, what is it that they're doing that we can get inspired? Uh, thank you. Um, firstly, um, I think it's brilliant and amazing that in Chatham House that we're having this sort of conversation. Um, I think that itself is actually a real, really important issue. And so I want to start there. Um, 
perhaps I, I, I kind of want to frame the conversation slightly in a different way. Um, I want to propose to you that we're living in an age of war everywhere right now. And the war is not Ukraine. The war is with our ecological systems and with future generations. We're literally terminating future generations and we're literally terminating our ecological base. This is the Great War. 78% of S&P 100s, if they had to price social and environmental costs, would not be viable. Everything you see around you are material gains of war, which is systemically destructive to future generations. So if you want to live, we are living in a zombie world right now. So when we talk about this space, and I think this is why this space is so important, is that I think we have to start to talk about a new great peace. A new great peace with the planet and a new great peace with future generations. Now, okay, that's a frame. I think to unpick this frame, I think we have to look at our language. Our language has been fundamentally constructed and designed. It is increasingly focused on noun-orientated languages. Our langu English language is largely a noun-orientated language. That noun orientation is all about objecthoods. So if you look back at Newtonian physics, it's a function of seeing the world through objects. The object orientation is also a function of classification. We know classification was used, is used as a device, was used as a device in race, certainly, to permit violence. The separation, the illusion of classification, permits a theory of violence. I want to propose it to the room the challenge that we're facing is the entanglement bites back. The reality of the entanglement makes the illusion of objecthood non-material. Climate change is a manifestation of the entanglement. The externalities are biting back and they're forcing us to recognize our entanglement. Now, in that convenient age, we often talk about localism. It's kind of nice words, these kind of nice words, localism, community, wholehearted words, but they're bullshit. <laughs> because I would ask you, if you look at yourself and anything about yourself, and you tell me how much of you is within 15 miles of, of it, microchips, clothes, rubber, any of it, glasses, you are already living in a planetary reality. I think it was Bucky Fuller, but somebody else will correct me, who said it takes a civilization to make a, pl uh, to make a pencil. It takes a whole planet to make a microchip. And the Ukraine crisis has made it clear that when uh, neon gases are not available, actually the prices of microchip being built in Taiwan actually go up massively. So we're already living in a planetary reality. We're living in a language structure which actually forces classification, which is no longer fit for purpose. And the reality is in that is that even us as human beings, I think the biggest transformation that we need to make is a reimagination of us. Michael Young, when he talked about uh, meritocracy and individualism, he was trying to point out the problems with it. Unfortunately, we took him literally. The reality is, even as us as human beings, we're massively entangled. Microbiomes, more than 50% of us is non-human DNA. Our, social, our brain is a function of our social networks. Epigenetically, we're connected to environments. The illusion of me as this sovereign individuality is an illusion. So the great project of our age is to reimagine what it means to be human. And every revolution has started with reimagining what it means to be human. So in order to build a world of collaboration, I think we have to reimagine what it means to be human and talk more about interbeing than the, the human being. Talk about our relationships and interdependencies in a different way, shift our language from object orientation to process orientation. This is a deep cultural revolution. So if you want to build the scale of a collaboration required at the planetary scale, it is a deep structural transformation of some of these 400-year-old frameworks. And these also change our relationship with the world. Our economics is derived on, derived on the idea of private economies, bilateral economies, 
two parties being in contract, which is the simplest way of building contract and value exchange. But increasingly, in a machine-orientated world, we can construct many-to-many -many economies, not just one-to-many, not just one-to-one, -one, but many-to-many -many frameworks. That changes the fundamental basis of our economic model, which allows for externalities to be recognized in different ways. Simultaneously, we can recognize the agency of things other than humans. So you've seen in New Zealand, rivers being given personhood. That is just the beginning of a world view. Now imagine a world view where we are not sovereign owners of things. Ownership is an act of enslaving one thing to the purposes of the other. Ownership is the act of enslaving one thing to the purposes of the other. We abolish slavery in, in the idea of humans. And increasingly, I think we're going to have to reimagine our relationship with the natural world in a new relationship, which is not about ownership, but being in treaty and being in relationship too. So, and that also finally leads to this issue of what I would say is reimagining our relationship to the commons. It is, it is evident that the tragedy of the commons and tragedy of the horizon actually are fundamental issues that we're about to actually have to deal with. And increasingly, we can deal with them by giving the commons agency, programmatic agency and, and verification models that were never possible before. We can create gods of the commons and actually embow them with power and relationships in new theories of governance that we've never imagined. So I suppose I want to say that I think if we want to talk about radical collaboration for sustainability, these are fundamental, deep-rooted transformations that we need to be part of. And that journey has already begun. Nothing I'm saying to you here is new. There are pathways of this exploration already on the table. We're working on self-sovereign houses. We're working on shifting the balance, material balance sheet of organizations. We're working on transnational institutions to deal with common goods uh, and how to, how to program collaboratively program new types of machine institutions. These things are emerging, and these are emergence of a new way of actually building the infrastructure for us to collaborate. But the deep project begins with us, reimagining us, and every revolution has done that. And I would say that if you look at Leonardo da Vinci and his image of Vitruvian man, it heralded 400 years worth of thinking. That age is over. We're in a new age. And the cultural revolution is fundamental to the collaborative revolution. And it starts with everything about how we imagine ourselves, our language, our institutions, and the nature of things around us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, Dan, and Indy. So I'm going to now open to for collab collaboration. Conversation, questions, Q and A's, reflections. Um, can people turn on the light? So otherwise, I can't see. Your name, your organisation, and your question or comment. Thank you very much. I'm Waltraud Denhard Herzog. I'm the director of the Austrian Cultural Forum. And my um, question would be: um, We have been talking about sustainability, and you know, question of the world with. We are tackling in the political field since you know the beginning of the first environmental international conference. So what makes the difference what you are discussing that what you know other international or global groups are discussing? And how would you think that the next London Biennale makes a difference? Um, to the international discussion which is going on since many years. And on a very practical point of view, you know, I'm coming from a country where we have, we are, we, we are very um, s um, conscious about sustainability. And um, for us, it's always strange to see that we discuss about sustainable questions, but at the same time, we are sitting in a room with the AC, which is you know, makes us freezing. Um, so I'm wondering if you all share um, my observation that we are all freezing, and if we could 
just we'll take the AC off, off turn, turn it off, or um, I, I, I don't want to, to feel everybody obliged, but I think it, it would be, you know, one action plan. Thank okay, you very much. That's a very immediate action plan that we can do with the AC. I can't speak for London Design Biennale, but do you want to take a that? address her question, and I can also talk maybe from the Chatham House perspective. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it's a, I mean, that's part of the ongoing issue with, with this as a topic, isn't it? Is that it's for decades, well, it's been, well, we need to do something about it. And it seems, I think, probably echoing a lot of what Indy said, that the, the structural issues, even the way we think about these topics, even the idea of sustainability being the framing as opposed to being something much more fundamental about our relationship with with nature or with 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 or with future generations is you know it, the, the level of framing is 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 not sufficient right and I, I would like to think that on some level an event like this biennale could at least offer some visions for how the world could actually be different in a in a sense that goes beyond well let's turn the air conditioning down or you know, let's have a conference about sustainability to a level which actually offers visions for how the world could be different, how life could be different, how people can collaborate differently. And I think that level of model, that level of actual visions of, of how things can be different is something that, you know, we've, we've hoped that politicians will do that previously, I think, and we've, but we've become reliant on a combination of Hollywood and and the internet to give us those visions, and it's a and it's and it's a dearth of, of possibility. And I think, but I, I I like to think that designers can, in collaboration with with others, can bring about some some visions that can be inspirational actually to some different forms of change. But I don't know how to say it. But so um, I I'd agree with you, and I'd go further. So. This is not about Chatham House, right? As a space, I want to talk more generically. Most architecture is absolutely terrible. Now, this room, from a kind of simple technical architecture level, you could say, well, it's all right. But the reality is, like pretty much every room, if you look at CO2 levels, indoor air pollution, light quality, sound quality, all sorts of things, actually the way we design architecture is not really to unlock the full capacity of what it means to be human. Indoor air pollution in your houses is five times worse than outdoor air pollution. So do you know when you get those little red notices, be careful when you're going outside, be careful when you're staying inside. So I think there is a fundamental misunderstanding. I mean, schizophrenia is five times worse in urban environments than rural environments. When you, I think we are living in the virtual microviolence and slums of the 21st century because we know light pollution, air pollution fundamentally affects your cognitive capabilities, your sleep, the quality of outcomes of your children. Air pollution reduces one year's worth of education capabilities. We know the stats, yet we haven't built the mechanism to build the environments that really unfold the full capacity of being human. And I think that is the revolution. As much as in the 19th century we got rid of the slums, we are, we are going to have to get rid of the slums of the 20th century to build a new type of city, which actually is about unfolding our full capacity. So I think what you herald and what you speak about is actually really important. This is why I was saying we are living in the Great War. The Great War is existing around you all the time. There are more, more microplastics now in your body than every, anywhere else, any time in history. We are being systemically polluted. I just don't think we recognize it. So I think when we talk about this environment, but I would say most architecture, if not all, is out of touch. And I think that is a revolution of our, our environment. And that has to be married with the transformation of our dealing with our carbon and other crises, because I think we have to unlock a new human, develop, human development environments. We have to reimagine how we create the environments for human development. And everything around you is microbiome neutral. We know that's not good for you. So uh, I could keep going, but I won't. Yeah, I hope that gets. Judy? I'm not speaking for Chatham House or the Biennale. I'm speaking as myself. But for me, there are two key relationships in sustainability. The first relationship 
is the relationship of people to nature. And second is the relationship of people to each other. And when I look at the deep heart of climate change, it is a failure of those two relationships. It's in fact a moral and spiritual failure. And when that lady was so alive to herself, this is what we need to be, to be alive to those relationships so that whenever we are sitting here and so on, we understand the implications of everything that is around us and everything that we buy into. That is the beginning of real change. So that awareness of the relational qualities of being fully alive as human, recognizing the presence of others who have to be treated as if they're fully alive as human. That is the fundamental that will drive us forward. It's a return, in a way, to a massive humanitarian position away from being mechanistic and automatic and assuming these are the way things are and they just carry on and we don't even notice. So, thank you. Um, so I was going to make a clarify. Nobody speaks on behalf of Chatham House. I think maybe only just Robin or Renata. So just to clarify, all the opinions that are emitted here at Chatham House are expert who work at Chatham House. It's their individual opinions. So just to say that. Um, I think just on your reflection, um, reflecting on what you said, um, I think our role and what we're trying to do is to add to the conversation. It shouldn't be the place. It should be one more place. And it should be what we can bring as our strength and also recognize all the weaknesses that we also have. I mean, um, the building, the, the weight of the legacy, some of the, you know, well, some of the le cultural legacies that I don't have because I don't, I'm not British, so I have none of the colony guilt. I'm a product of a colony from Portugal. So n those things don't matter to me. What matters to me is that I work in a place that enables me and my team and my colleagues to foster the space, whether it's physical or a temporal space or imaginary space for, for ideas to come together. And so it's to add and it is to challenge. To com I absolutely agree with Indy and with Judy. And this is like, and the, 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 the question for our collective is what is, how do we think change happens? Do you completely tear down everything that we know because we do revolution and then what do we build instead? Do we do reformation or do we do evolution, right? And I'm not going to make comment on all of those because there are merits for that. But I think that's the question that I want to sort of leave for all of us to think about. Um, five more minutes, one or two more questions. Here, uh, there's a hand here. Your name, organization, and... Hi, I'm Rowena from um, a member of Chatham House Institute. Um, I um, listened to uh, the speakers and thank you very much. Um, especially that uh, you have uh, suggested uh, how design can um, foster changes. And also, um, one of the speakers also talked about um, not to rely on the private sector, but um, the emancipation emancipation of people from slaving, which I completely agree. Um, there is a political um, dimension and a scientific dimension that uh, we can further think about. Uh, on a scientific dimension, I'm just wondering, would uh, the LDBS uh, consider um, collaborating with uh, scientists as well? Because uh, this would make um, the um, design um, more practical. And on the political aspect, just as you said, it can be a reform, it can be a revolution, it can be a, a, a change. And I think um, uh, we can think about um, whether individuals uh, will be um, equipped well for uh, such changes, because otherwise um, the emancipation can become a lack of capitalism or a lack of private sector, and then it becomes, um, could be the other end of the political um, um, conundrum. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Comments, questions? Do you want to reflect? 
may be that in some, yeah, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the quote that's sometimes attributed to, to Frederick Jameson, sometimes to, to um, Zizek, this idea that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, right? And, and, and there are developments of that idea. People have taken it in different directions, like Mark Fisher talked about, like, you know, kind of alternative, you know, is in, in that way. I think what I would say with some of this is that the sorts of things we're talking about are not about necessarily a model replacing everything, although maybe ultimately they, they would do, but it's partly, about, it's partly about creating new possibilities of how things could be different that are different to what we even can conceive of as present. And yet there are seeds of those ideas probably in every single person and in every community and in communities that are not normally included in that conversation. And so I sort of see it as more, I mean, at least from my point of view, as more of a kind of pluriversal thing. I think design enables that in a way that perhaps in a slightly different way to, to, to traditionally, which means, yeah, voices, I mean, obviously science should be part of that, but also other political approaches which maybe are outside of a you know, conventional kind of spectrum as we see it, because I think there are other things that are difficult perhaps to conceive of on that spectrum, but nevertheless, creative approaches can, can enable some way into them. I don't know if that makes sense. The one thing I'd say is that um, I think this revolution reformation question is really interesting. I want to frame it in the fact that there are 8 billion so people alive and, they, and those 8 billion people sit on the platform of 500 billion units of hydrocarbon equivalent human energy a year. 500 billion. So we have basically 8 billion people live on the energy framework of 500 billion people. We do not have the hydrocarbons to mine the materials to make the cities of the future. So the reality of our material economy is that we're likely stuck with our material economy largely as it is. So when we talk about revolutions, I think these are revolutions in the intangibles. And intangible revolutions of perception, language, ways of framing, ways of holding, I think those are, those are going to be deeply revolutionary and they are likely necessary but almost certainly on us. So as we saw with, I don't know, uh, the rise of bureaucracy under the Kaiser, that was a revolution of organizing which created treasury functions and other things. I think we're going to see those reimagined as new computational capabilities transform our theory of bureaucracy in a new age. That, and that will give rise to new capabilities and new ways of seeing sovereignty and agency. So I think it's an intangible revolution and it's a cultural revolution which will reframe the world around us. Um, and that will give rise to a new relationship with materiality. But be no, I mean, if you look at the 500 billion tons of, we're sitting on about 500 billion slaves. Our lives are a function of those energy functions and those are all non-viable. So, I think we are facing a revolution, regardless of whether we want to talk about it or not. It's here. Yeah. Judy? I think we need to build on what we want, and participation is one of the keys. Often when we reach out to people, especially new members who have never participated in anything at all, we find that people are not immediately consultable. <laughs> To be consultable is actually a very high level of awareness. So it's something that needs to be built. You build the relationship and you build the capacity. But without engaging people, we cannot change in a peaceful way. Part of peace is having be able to take people along with us. And the best way to take people along with us, first of all, is co-creation. And secondly, is numbers. Can we involve enough numbers? Because one of the things we are faced with is we know instinctively and practically the transformation we need to go through is immense. So in order to start on that road, we need to build that participation, that communication in a way that people do feel involved and be able to make the sacrifices they need to make, especially in the West. In the rich countries, we will be asked to consume less and all those things, and they will be seen as sacrifices. People need to have reason for that sacrifice. I think one of the most urgent exercises for designers to design 
because I see everything as design. You design the economy, you design the transport, you design the lifestyle, you, all those choices are designed and, and so on. It's really what we need to do is a Western new model of one planet living. The whole world wants to live better, especially the poorer countries, and they look at what we are like now and think, we want to be like them, why can't we be like them? It's up to the West to come up with one planet living in the West as a model that we can aspire to for the world, and that takes a lot of design. Thank you. Um, so I think I am on time, maybe one minute. Uh, thank you, everyone. So we have a break now. So before, break is upstairs, right? So before, I'm, I, I hope that this conversation um, got you thinking. <laughs> and intrigued. So thank you very much, and I'll see you back at 4 o'clock. That was my bad. Bad chairing. I thought I did a good job. I didn't. You Victoria. <laughs> no, I can't be heard. Sorry. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> so, 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 to hold you back from tea, I just wanted that. to answer Vicky, a couple of the questions so that were sorry. asked uh, that the independent panel on the stage could not answer, um, or that the air conditioning um, is being turned down. That's the easy one. But I did also want to say uh, to the question about uh, science being part of design and being part of the London Design Biennale, uh, it most definitely and absolutely is. Uh, embraced and incorporated into our definition of design. The London Design Biennale exists in part to broaden out what that definition is uh, and what it means and uh, exhibits range from everything from systems design through engineering, uh, through product, and it may be sonography to change hearts and minds or it may be building material that is uh, saving the Earth's resources. They would both be part of that. Finally, and in conversation just with uh, ARIC, London Design Biennale and the Het New Institute, uh, we are passionate about this not being just the same old thing as you suggested it might be. Uh, we haven't got all the answers, of course, but uh, in the title, Remapping Collaborations, the aim is to remap collaborations. I think there's almost uh, amongst the creative industries, we could almost be sort of smug in how international and how collaborative we are. And yet, what we're saying is doing the same thing the same way will have the same result. The aim of the Biennale and this Biennale in 2023 is to shake that up and say, OK, that's not quite getting us there. What can we do now to do better? So thanks very much. See you back at 4 o'clock.